this video might be shaky because I feel shaky. Uh, it's been two and a half, three hours since we were in there and we didn't have great news. The application is still not done. <laughs> Don't want to be in Quito anymore. Quito's a great city. Waiting around, not so great. I am Ecuador's first digital nomad. Well, actually not quite, but I am the first person to apply for Ecuador's nomad visa. When I arrived here at Pacoche Lodge, I had just finished shooting my 75th video about Ecuador and I also received news that my visa status in Ecuador was no longer complicated. Yes, I have been skirting that issue in many of my last videos, but I can now stay in Ecuador on a two-year nomad visa. In this video, I'm going to explain what Ecuador's nomad visa is, why I personally chose to get the nomad visa over other visas, my experience trying to become the first official digital nomad in Ecuador, where I cried three times out of complete frustration and I seriously considered leaving Ecuador. I will also share all of the costs, the official ones, and then all of the money I spent in the last few months trying to get this visa. And then finally, I'll wrap it up for you and let you know what I think about the Ecuador Nomad visa and would I recommend it. is Ecuador's digital nomad visa? Well, it's aimed at remote workers and digital nomads who want to spend more than 180 days in the country. And it's good for up to two years. Now to apply for this visa, you need to show three things. One, that you make at least 1275 US dollars a month, or you made 15,300 in the previous year. You also need to show that you have health insurance and that you are either a remote worker for a company or you're a digital nomad that has a business registered abroad. Two caveats for this. They don't say that you need to get a criminal check, but you actually need to do one for every visa in Ecuador. So you need to have your fingerprints. In Canada, you send them to the RCMP and they will give you a, an official piece of paper that says you don't have a criminal background. I believe in the US, it's through the FBI. The second thing is, is I've heard some people say that you need to have an official translator, one that I think is like a legal translator. That's not true. All of my documents, Andreas translated, and a few I did through Google Translate, and that was sufficient. So that's a cost that you don't need to spend. Now through all of this, you think, wow, that's so easy, right? Well, let me share with you what my experience was. We're in the Seminario San Luis at a little spot called El Compasionario, so the place to confess. And so I think this is the perfect place to share my experience with the digital nomad visa in Ecuador. In my videos, I try to highlight the best of Ecuador, but no place is perfect. And so I do try to give it some perspective. And I cannot celebrate receiving the digital nomad visa without telling you the truth. It was really frustrating. I cried three times and I seriously considered leaving Ecuador. And I'm not sharing this because I want to criticize, but I actually want to help others. Know what to expect? There will be bumps along the way and that's completely normal. I was initially approached by the Ministry of Tourism because I had been so vocal with everyone I knew that worked in tourism about wanting to receive the digital nomad visa. In fact, Andreas actually tweeted the minister several times letting him know. And so when they contacted me, I was ecstatic because my visa extension was only three months and then I would have to leave the country. This was the perfect solution. Looking at the requirements, I knew I had everything they needed. I had the income, I had the business, and I had insurance. I also wasn't a criminal, which is pretty important if you want to move somewhere. Content creators like me have different streams of income. So you may know me because of this YouTube channel, but the reality is that's not my job. I publish here twice a week and I make 
pennies from YouTube. My actual job is my website, Bacon is Magic. For the last 12 years, I've been sharing stories around the world of the best food and international recipes. The best part is, my advertising revenue from this website actually meets the requirements. I am eligible to become a digital nomad here. I was so excited for the opportunity, and to be honest, my ego also loved the idea of saying I was the very first digital nomad in Ecuador. But you know, as exciting as it was, things in the government take much longer than expected. Not just here, but everywhere else in the world. And with all these great people working with me, you'd think it'd be easy peasy. They would sign the bill, I'd walk into the Department of Foreign Affairs, they would approve me on the spot, and we'd be on our way. Actually, it got complicated. Really complicated. So before we move on, let me share with you what I submitted because if you're a content creator, this will help you. I worked with Notary80 in Quito. I had no affiliation with them. They were the closest ones and actually happened to be amazing. The first thing I needed to do was prove that my website, Bacon is Magic, was mine. So I gave them my website, which they reviewed. It has information about me on it. And then what I did was I took the front homepage, printed it. I also put Google Translate on the front homepage, printed that so it was in Spanish, which they notarized. Now other people will tell you that you need an official translator that's approved. That was not our experience. Andreas translated half of the things and I used Google Translate for, the, for my website and it was absolutely fine. When I submitted it, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, my agent there, she said I also had to go back and do the same thing for the About Me page. Notarization in Ecuador is a standard fee of $1.25 a page, so get both done. It'll save you some time. I also needed to prove my income was mine. Now, because I make money on my website, I have uh, an advertising platform with Mediavine. I needed to print out the page that showed the last three months of income, the last three months of payments that they paid me. It also needed to be translated and notarized. I also needed to share the criminal check, and my insurance policy. Now initially they asked for two years of an insurance policy. However, I'm a digital nomad. I'm not actually planning on staying in Ecuador the entire time. So we explained to them that my plans were to stay in Ecuador until June. And I have an insurance policy until then. And so they were able to just accept that. I know you're thinking, oh, fantastic, that was easy. The thing you need to know is it really depends on the agent that you get. So I would go in expecting to have several appointments and just be flexible knowing that you're probably going to have to spend more money on printing things, translating things, and notarizing things. In the end, I ended up spending about $150. overstayed my visa by two business days. If you will recall, I had been sharing so many times the date that my visa extension ended. Everybody knew about it and everyone said to me, don't worry about it. And in fact, everyone believed that because I had the interview, that essentially froze my visa status. And then we realized that that's not true. And the reason is because everyone I had been talking to was not from the department that issues the fine. So both the Ministry of Tourism and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs believed that I was okay. However, the ministry that handles tourists and foreigners coming in and out of the country and issuing the fines for overstaying is actually migration. And so they issued a fine of $212.50. Now, we went into migration and Andreas pleaded with them, explained the situation, and they agreed it was not my fault. The Ministry of Tourism agreed it was not my fault. Even the Ministry of Foreign Affairs agreed it was not my fault. For weeks, they were talking back and forth, writing letters, doing the official things, trying to decide who was going to handle this fine. Because I had said to them, that's not gonna be me. It was a matter of principle. Now, 
I had already invested a lot of money and time into getting this visa. But the issue of having the fine felt really unfair to me because I was ready months ago and everyone told me I would be fine. And several times I raised issues. Don't forget, my visa is going to expire. No, 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 you're fine. And then I wasn't fine. Well, I was fined $212.50. And so we decided we're moving on. You guys figure it out. We're going to travel the coast. And then when we arrived in Manta, I learned that all three departments decided that it was no one's fault, but I still had to pay that fine. And I cried. I really cried. And out of principle, I didn't know. Like, was I going to pay it or just walk away? But at the end of the day, I'm not getting this visa because I care about the government or care about promoting migration or any of these things. I love Ecuador. And Ecuadorians, both here and abroad, and the people who want to visit here and move here, all of you have been amazing. I make these videos for you, not because I care about what the government thinks. And so I paid the $212.50. Now, I want to share with you how much I paid in total to get this visa. But first, I need a drink. These are the official fees that I paid. $50 for the application. $400 to actually get the visa fee. $150 in notarizations. $120 for the criminal check. $80 for the embassy certification. $25 for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs certification. $25 for photocopies. And $250 for couriers. So that is $1,000. And then I paid another $212. Keep in mind, that doesn't account for all the money that I spent on hotels, food, transportation, as we hung around Quito thinking that each week it was going to happen. We did try to make the best of it, and that's why I have videos on La Tacunga, Cotopaxi, but the reality of it is, I was supposed to be traveling the coast making a lot more videos than I did at that time. I estimate that I probably spent $1,500 to $1,750 USD, which is over $2,000 Canadian dollars. And you want to know the best news? I am not Ecuador's first digital nomad. I was the first to apply, but I was the third to get it. Two people applied from their home countries and they received it before me. And so I'm number three. I like to think that I'm number one and Andreas insists that I'm number one because I was the first to apply. It just doesn't feel the same. Now I know you're wondering, would I recommend Ecuador's digital nomad visa? Let me start by saying Ecuador has beautiful landscapes, incredible food, amazing people, fantastic Wi-Fi. It is a great place to live and work. It also has something that you may want to know about, and that's the professional visa. If you have a university or college degree, I would actually recommend this visa only because it's more established people understand it, and the process appears to be more streamlined. However, if you're a remote worker or a digital nomad and you do not have a degree, I would still recommend the digital nomad visa in Ecuador. If you can, I would apply from it for it in your home country. And if not, if you're here, I would just give yourself a little bit more time. This is still a new visa and people are still coming to grasp with what a nomad is and so it may take you a while to actually prove that you do meet the requirements. I'm glad I went through the process even though it was upsetting at times and very costly but 
If anything, I hope that by sharing this video with you and having gone through the process, it helps you with your process getting a visa here in Ecuador because I love this country and I think you will too.